All right, turn with me to Matthew 21. <clears throat> I got to love allergy season. It's so fun. Ah, TMI. Sorry, TMI. Uh, chapter 21. Uh, this is where we see the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ as he comes into Jerusalem. He'll be hailed as the Jewish Messiah. Before this scene, we saw Jesus down with the disciples and multitudes of people were down at the Jordan River and he healed many people down there. Um, last time we saw Jesus telling his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested, betrayed, I'm going to be mocked, I'm going to be spit upon, I'm going to be scourged, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to rise from the dead on the third day. And they were clueless. They had no idea what Jesus was talking about. They're still thinking, oh, he's going to set up the kingdom when we get to Jerusalem. But they were clueless. And so as they leave the Jordan River, they and the multitudes uh, pass through Jericho. And we left off last time seeing uh, Jesus healing the blind man, uh, blind Bartimaeus and his friend. And they're probably part of this procession now. They're moving up a multitude of people heading up to Jerusalem. It's about 15 miles from Jericho to Jerusalem. And so they're making this trek up there. And on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus and his disciples, they'll make a stop in the village of Bethany, which is on the east side of the Mount of Olives. They would have dinner with Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus, whom the Lord had recently raised from the dead. And so in John chapter 12, we're told that um, this was six days before Passover. So this is a Saturday that they make this trek up to uh, Bethany. Jesus would spend the night there, and then the next day was Sunday. But it wasn't just any Sunday. This would become known as Palm Sunday, and we'll see why here in a moment. This was the day, a specific day that was prophesied about where Jesus would ride on this little donkey into Jerusalem, hailed as the king of Israel. So chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And it's Mark and Luke's Gospels. It mentions both the towns of Bethany and Bethphage. Uh, by the way, Bethany means house of dates, and Bethphage means house of figs. Some versions say house of unripened figs, and that'll play a significant role later in this chapter. But again, Mark and Luke will tell us that Jesus will ride on this young donkey, and they say, which no one has ever sat on or ridden, and Jesus says, loose it and bring it to me. You know, if you get on a, a young colt or a young donkey, a foal, they don't want anybody sitting on them. You know, and so we'll see Jesus in charge of this whole thing. He's exercising his sovereign authority during this final week of his earthly life. He's using his divine nature here to organize his own crucifixion. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it. This was not a mistake. This was going to take place. The king, he is in control. This is what Jesus says about this scene leading up to this. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So Jesus is in control of everything. I mean, this is the whole reason why he came from heaven to earth, to be the final sacrifice for all of our sins. He knows when he has to die. It has to be on Passover. You know, Passover is when they uh, would remember the original Passover when they are in Egypt, the you know, the 10th plague there that allowed the Jews to leave uh, Egypt during the Exodus was when the Lord would destroy the firstborn throughout all of Egypt. And he says, this is what you need to do. Take a lamb, you know, you sacrifice it, you put the blood on the lintel and the doorposts. And when the death angel passes over, that's where Passover comes from, and he sees the blood, then you'll be spared. He'll pass over your home and you're safe. So Jesus is the Passover lamb, the ultimate lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
the death angel passes over us because we're covered in the blood of the Lamb. We are safe and secure in the Lord's hands. So he knew he had to die on this day. He would be fulfilling his role as the Lamb of God. By the way, this is why it is so wrong to blame certain groups of people for the crucifixion of Jesus. You know, there's a lot of countries, there's a lot of people groups over the years that have tried to blame the Jews for crucifying our Messiah. You killed Jesus. And they get all upset. This is where anti-Semitism comes in. It's totally wrong. This is where some people try to blame the Romans. Well, the Romans, they're the ones who executed him. Pontius Pilate ordered his death. The Romans put the nails in his hands. The Romans put him on the Roman cross. It's not their fault either. You know, if you want to blame anybody for the crucifixion of Christ, just look in the mirror when you get home. We're the ones that put Jesus on the cross. We're the ones that he died for because he loves us. But the ultimate blame, if you want to call it that, for Jesus dying was God. God himself, Jesus himself. Jesus knew this is the only way that the sins of the world could be paid for. And so that's where the ultimate blame goes, is to the Lord. This is not a tragic mistake, but this was an act of his unconditional love. This is why verses like Romans 5, 8 are so important, where Paul writes, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That's why his grace is so amazing. So verse 3, he says, And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. Talking about the donkey and her foal. And immediately he will send them. So this is great. If anybody questions you, why are you taking my donkeys? <laughs> well, the Lord has need of them. And he'll say, oh, okay, that's cool. I challenge you to go to the Ford or Chevy dealership <laughs> and say, hey, I really like this convertible. The Lord needs it for today. <laughs> See how far that goes. Well, I don't think it'll go over very well. Anyway, the Lord has need of it, and this guy will give him the disciples, the donkeys. Verse 4, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here Matthew quotes from Zechariah. Look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 on the screen. Here's the full prophecy. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now this is the first of at least three prophecies that are mentioned in this section of Scripture that takes place here on Palm Sunday. We'll look at verse 6. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So this is where the idea for Palm Sunday comes from. I guess it sounds better than clothes and robes Sunday. Most of the stuff they put before them were their robes and their clothes. They took some, when it says branches, it just means leafy branches. Some could have been palm branches. There was other trees there that they would put before him, these branches. So this is something that the people would do when a king would ride into town, they're paying homage to Jesus as a king. And they're all excited because he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Verse 9. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Again, what an amazing scene this is. Multitudes are following Jesus. During Passover, there would be about two and a half million Jews in Jerusalem. And when I talk multitudes, they're talking probably tens of thousands of people following as he comes up the crest of Mount of Olives. There'll be 
Ten thousands more that'll come join him from you know the Temple Mount. They'll see him coming, and they're all excited because you hear all this noise. So it's just a huge thing. So here, picture Jesus on this little donkey. Uh, he's coming to the top of the Mount of Olives. When he reaches the top, there before him is the city of Jerusalem. There before him is the Temple Mount with the glorious temple there before him. And all of a sudden, the multitudes start to praise him as the Messiah. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna means save us now. And so they're excited. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, this is fulfilling another prophecy. Psalm 118. Look at these verses, starting in verse 25. Save now. That's Hosanna. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Now again, there's a lot of stuff happening at this time. One thing that's interesting is here Jesus riding on this little donkey. Normally when a king would come into a city after conquering some nation or some people, they'd be on a big massive stallion and they'd be riding in, looking down at everybody around them. Jesus, you can picture his feet just kind of dragging on the ground on this little tiny donkey, he's at eye level. I mean, he's not putting himself above everybody. He's right there among the people. Luke chapter 19, verse 39. While the people are screaming and praising the Lord, the Pharisees are also yelling at him, but something different. Luke 19, starting in verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if, it, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. I always thought, ah, oh, that'd be the first rock concert if the stones started <laughs> crying out. And if you've seen the Rolling Stones lately, they look like they've been around for 2,000 years. They're not aging well. They're getting up there. Anyway, but the rocks, the stones would immediately cry out. Here's another thing that's happening at this time as well. Being the first day of the week, which is Sunday, the priests in Jerusalem would do something interesting every Sunday. They would read from Psalm 24. Some of the priests would stand on the wall. Other priests would stand down below. And it was like a, a back and forth as they went through Psalm 24. Look at these verses, Psalm 24, starting in verse 7. So the priests down below on the road, they would be you know, saying, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Then the priests on the wall would say, who is this king of glory? And the priests down below would say, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, the king of glory shall come in. And the priests on the wall would shout, who is this king of glory? And they would say, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. And so what an amazing scene this is. I mean, all the people shouting and praising, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These priests are, you know, quoting from Psalm 24. The only people not excited are the Pharisees who are mad at Jesus. They're complaining, make your disciples shut up. And so you know what Jesus is doing at this moment is he crests the top of Mount... So when you think of Mount of Olives, it's not a big mountain. It's more of a hill. So he gets to the top of the hill. He looks down the Kidron Valley, and then he sees the Temple Mount. You know what happens when he gets to the top and he looks over the city? He begins to weep. He be I mean, literally, it means he sobs. Look at these verses, Luke 19, starting in verse 41. It says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city... And wept over it. Again, it means he sobbed convulsively, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, take note of that phrase, this your day, because it's referring to a specific day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. Hmm. 
and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So Jesus is weeping, he is sobbing, because he knows what the Romans are going to do when they come into the city. He's prophesying about 70 AD, the Roman army led by General Titus would come in. They would just wipe out everything. They would slaughter about one million Jews, and the rest of the Jews would scatter. Some would end up on the um, Masada, and just an amazing scene that is. But anyway, um, it, it's why he's weeping. He knows what's going to happen in the immediate future because they did not know the time of their visitation. I've often wondered why this got labeled the triumphal entry. I mean, think about it. I mean, four days from this scene, he's going to be beaten. He's going to be, you know, flayed open with the cat of nine tails. He's going to be crucified on the cross. To me, the real triumphal entry is... Revelation chapter 19, that is when Jesus comes back riding on the white horse, not a little donkey, but he's coming back as the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's going to wipe out the enemies of this world. This is in the near future, and we're going to be riding back with him when this takes place. It says his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. It'll split in two, and it's interesting because it was only in the 1970s the Jews discovered there was a fault line under the Mount of Olives. And it will split in two. He will go up to the temple. He will begin his reign as the, the Messiah, the King of Kings, for a thousand years on the Temple Mount. He'll rule from Jerusalem, the millennial reign of Christ. But at the same time, if Jesus wept over the sad state of Jerusalem at this time, knowing what's coming, I wonder what he's thinking now. I mean, he's got to be so grieved over our nation, how we have turned our back this last generation so quickly from the Lord, from His Word. I mean, it's amazing how we are in a free fall spiritually. But you look at the world condition around us. I mean, we're living in rebellion against God. It's like the days of Noah. Jesus said the last days will be like the days of Noah. If you could put that scripture back up, Luke 19, verse 41, you'll see why this makes a difference and why Jesus makes a reference to this. He says, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, keep going. Yeah. And then the last verse, verse 44, he says, Because you did not know the time of your visitation. In other words, he says, The people did not know the time, a specific time. They did not recognize this specific day um, we're going to look at a ver probably one of the most famous, one of the most important prophecies in all the Bible. It's from Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 24. This is the angel Gabriel telling Daniel what's going to happen in the future concerning Israel. He said, Gabriel tells Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Seventy weeks, the Hebrew word for weeks is Shabua. It means a week of days or it means a week of sevens. In context, we'll see this is 70 sevens are determined for your people, your holy city. So 490 years. During this 490 years, this is what's going to happen. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. That's what Jesus did at his first coming. The second coming will bring in to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Again, this is what happens during this 490-year period. Verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, that's what we're looking at, Messiah the Prince coming, when was that command given to restore and build Jerusalem? We know the date. It was March 14th, 445 B.C., King Artaxerxes, and it's referenced in Nehemiah chapter 2, the first 13 verses or so. That date, March 14th, 445 B.C., till Messiah the Prince, he says here, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So that's the first 69 sevens, or 483 years. It was Sir Robert Anderson of the Scotland Yard. He wrote a book called The Prince, The Coming Prince. 
And in it, he did all these calculations on the day that Jesus would arrive. We know the date when it started, 14, March 14, 445 B.C. You go 483 years. He used the, um, the yeah, Roman calendar back then, 360 days. That's what the Jews use also. 360-day calendar, 483 years. It equals 173,880 days. So you start March 14, 445 B.C. You go forward, 173,000. 880 days, and you come to, this is the neat part, April 6th, 32 AD. That's when he believes this event took place, Jesus riding on the donkey, because the command to go forth, restore and build Jerusalem, we know that date, March 14th, until Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus, there'll be this 483-year period. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. You know how it went with Nehemiah rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem. Verse 26, after the 62 weeks, so this is after the 483 years, the Messiah shows up. It says, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That phrase cut off means to suffer the death penalty. Messiah is going to show up. He's going to be cut off. He's going to suffer the death penalty, not for himself. Why does it say that? Well, he didn't die for himself. He died for you and me. He died for the sins of the world. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's why Jesus was weeping in 70 AD. They wiped it out. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Verse 27, it says, Then he, now we skip ahead. We're looking in the last days. The he here is a reference to the Antichrist. How do we know that? Well, look. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. This is the final seven-year period. But in the middle of the week, so three and a half years into it, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So Jesus quotes that verse in Matthew 24, verse 15, Jesus tells the Jews on the Olivet Discourse, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let the reader understand, flee, get out of Israel, run for the hills. Revelation 12 tells us they do, they flee into the wilderness, God will protect them for the final three and a half years, and it's during the Great Tribulation. So this is one of the reasons we say God's not done with the Jews, we're not into replacement theology. God has a work for the Jews. He's presently, he brought them back into the land in the last days, just like he said he would. May 14th, 1948, he brought them back to Israel. We get to Revelation chapter 7. He calls 12,000 Jewish men from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, 144,000. They will minister during the Great Tribulation time. So God has not replaced the Jews. He is still going to do a work. The church, we're made up of Jews and Gentiles. Whoever comes to Jesus will be saved. But he's not finished. When Christ returns, Revelation 1-7 says, Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, in reference to the Jews, and they will get saved. So, a lot of stuff happening in this scene. And Jesus is saying, if you'd only known this your day, the things that make for your peace, but they did not understand. Well, look at verse 10, back here in Matthew 21. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. When it says all the city was moved, the word moved there comes from the Greek word that means seismic. Like you get a seismic earthquake. It's, it's shaking. The whole city is just rumbling because of all the excitement of Jesus being here. I mean, this place was rocking for sure. And when the people are saying, who is this? Why is there such an uproar? They're shouting, this is Jesus, the prophet. This is the one that was spoken of. This is the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. By the way, this particular Sunday, Palm Sunday, was the day the lambs would be examined prior to being slaughtered for the Passover. And so Jesus, the Lamb of God, will be examined shortly. So this would take place on the 10th of Nisan. 
Passover is always on the 14th of Nisan, and so this being Sunday was the 10th when he's examined. The 14th would make it Thursday when he'd be crucified on the day of Passover. Jesus, the Lamb of God, he would present himself to religious leaders. Keep that in mind. Look at verse 12. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves." I wonder how many churches he could say that to today. How many organizations out there that are just totally in it for the money, ripping people off. For those of you that have the image of Jesus being meek and mild like a little child, that's all he ever, he never said a harsh word. He would never offend anybody. Well, hopefully this scene will open your eyes because when necessary, he would display the righteous indignation of God, the anger of God towards those who are misrepresenting God, towards those who are abusing God's people, he gets upset. Now, the guys here, these religious leaders, they were self-righteous, they were self-promoting, they, they were just hucksters, as we'll see. These guys literally had turned the temple of God. Now, when he's talking about the temple, it's not just the building, it's the courtyards as well. You'd have the court of the Jews, you'd have the court of the women, you'd have the court of the Gentiles. And they'd turned the court of the Gentiles at this time into a stockyard. This is where they kept all the animals for slaughtering. I mean, they were just totally in it for money. It was a big, corrupt business. The Feast of Passover, along with... Pentecost and Feast of Tabernacles were the three required feasts that Jewish men had to attend. And the Jewish people would travel throughout the Roman Empire to attend these feasts. Over Passover, you'd have to bring a one-year-old lamb to Passover to be slaughtered. Your family would raise it as a baby, and then a year you'd take it to the temple. You'd take it to the Temple Mount. These priests, these guys, would look at your lamb and they would examine it, and they would either say it's clean or it's got a blemish. We can't use it. Now, here's where the corruption came in. They had another thing you could do. If you were from Rome, let's say you're a Jew living in Rome, and you had to travel all that way to Jerusalem, you could sell your lamb there in Rome, take the money, the Roman money, bring it to the temple. Money changers, this is where you'd exchange your money. You'd have Roman money. The, Rome, uh, the Jews wouldn't accept it, so it's like, nope, we have to give you shekels. And so they would give them the money for their lamb, and they would say, basically, we'll give you 50 cents on the dollar. So they're ripping the people off, these money changers. And then you'd have to buy one of our lambs here for like three or four times the price of a lamb. This is where they're ripping the people off. So if you lived around Jerusalem and you brought your lamb there, you'd go to the same place. These guys would look at the lamb. It could be a perfectly good-looking lamb. They say, oh, it's got a blemish over here. We can't accept Wait a minute. No, no, you can't accept it. We'll take it on trade. You can buy one of our lambs, pre-approved sacrificial lamb. And they would charge, again, two or three times what the lamb was worth. As soon as that family is like, okay, they'd leave because they wanted to worship the Lord. They'd take that lamb that they said, oh, it's blemished. They'd put it in the pen with all the other pre-approved lambs just to resell it. And this was the scam that was going on. This is why Jesus was so upset with these guys. Amazing. The poor families, they couldn't do anything about it. This is why Jesus got so angry with these guys. He's flipping over their tables. He's driving them out of there. He was sick and tired of seeing these guys raking in all this money from the you know, simple People that wanted to be there to worship God. That's what it was all about. That's why Jesus tells these crooks, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. It was G. Campbell Morgan who said this, quote, A den of thieves is the place thieves would run to when they needed to hide. But the chief priests and scribes used the temple to cover up and hide their sin and hypocrisy. But Jesus, he's rooting out this den of thieves, you might say. This also explains why Annas, who is running this whole scheme, 
He was the former high priest, but everybody still looked at him as the high priest. His son-in-law, Caiaphas, was the actual high priest, but they were scamming the people, and he's in charge of this. And so when Jesus is arrested, he will be sent to Annas for questioning. And Annas was very upset with Jesus because he's digging into his business here. He's throwing a monkey wrench into his whole scheme here. So... Here Jesus quotes, in verse 13, he's quoting from Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7. Verse 14, so he drives off these corrupt people. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Now this is remarkable for a couple of reasons. First of all, the blind and the lame were not welcome on the temple mount. The priests made sure they were not welcome on the temple mounts. Their infirmities made them a blemish. You know, they were blemished in the eyes of the priests. And just as religious leaders rejected the blemished lambs, they rejected what they considered blemished people. So Jesus drives them out. And guess who comes to Jesus? All the broken, beaten down, so-called blemished people. And what's he do? He blesses them. He touches them. It says he heals them. The wonderful thing about Jesus is he, when he touches, when he blesses, when he heals someone, when he saves a person, they're not considered unclean anymore. Remember what he did with all the lepers? Lepers had to walk down the street shouting, unclean, unclean, if anybody was approaching them. And they'd have to walk way around them. Jesus would heal a leper and touch him, which was illegal to do under the law, but he would touch him. If they accused him of breaking the law, he said, what do you mean I broke the law? This person's not a leper. They're not unclean. I just touched them. They're clean. That's what he's done with all of us. We've all been under the leprosy of sin. We've all had blemishes. We're all fallen short of the glory of God. And he touches us, and now we're considered clean. We're considered holy, righteous in Christ, not because of anything we've done, but because of who Christ is and what he has done. When Jesus is in the church, I hope that the blemished, the blind, outcasts, I hope they come and get touched and saved by Jesus. Listen, people should be able to come to church where Jesus is the head of the church with all their brokenness, with their sin, their need for salvation, their need for forgiveness. Come to Jesus and be ministered to because, again, it's interesting that when he drove out the hypocrites, then the hurting, needy people started coming to him. I wonder how many times he's done that with us, where he's driven out the hypocrites, so to speak, so that people like us can gather together to worship him, to seek him. They, they, these guys were afraid of the religious leaders. They're not afraid of Jesus, because they know Jesus is going to minister to them. Be afraid of religion, but know that Jesus loves you. Verse 15, when the chief priests and scribes, this is hilarious to me, they saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. I mean, this blows my mind. When the religious hypocrites saw the wonderful things that Jesus did, when they hear the children praising him, Hosanna, save us now to the son of David, they become indignant, which means they're filled with anger and wrath. This is not righteous indignation. This is what judgmentalism looks like. Verse 16, And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, of course I do. Then he says, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise? Again, I love this. We've seen Jesus do this on a number of occasions where he tells these so-called experts in the law, have you never read? They've read everything in the Old Testament. They knew Genesis to Malachi. They had it down. They could give, well, they didn't have chapters and verses back then. They could say right here in this scroll, Right there, it says this, but they did not know the Lord. They didn't know the meaning of the Scriptures. They had it in their head. They didn't have it in their hearts. These guys prided themselves on how much they read the Bible. Jesus points out the fact that just because you read the Bible doesn't mean you believe the Bible. 
Jesus would say to these religious leaders things like John chapter 5, verse 39 to 40. He says, you search the scriptures, and they did, for in them you think you have eternal life. That's what they thought. We're good workers. We're going to earn our way. But Jesus says, and these, these scriptures, are they which testify of me. The whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. Then he says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. And that was true early in his ministry, and that was true at the end of his ministry. These guys were too self-righteous to see their need for Jesus. And so when Jesus says to them here, have you never read? And then he quotes this verse out of Psalm chapter 8, which proclaims the, the glory of the Lord, all capital letters, Yahweh, and the Lord, Adonai. And Jesus, the cool thing about this, he ascribes this to himself. He is Yahweh. He is Adonai. Look at these verses in Psalm chapter 8, starting in verse 1. O Lord, that's Yahweh, our Lord, that's Adonai, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, and this is what Jesus is quoting here, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. And that is exactly what Jesus did with these hypocrites. He silences them. When I consider your heaven, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the Son of Man, just speaking of our kids and grandkids, that you visit Him. That's exactly what Jesus just did with these hurting, broken people as He received the praise of these children. He lowered Himself. He visited them. He heaped blessing upon blessings upon them. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Your name in all the earth. Verse 17 then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there, probably with uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Verse 18, now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. Now, that's an interesting statement. Jesus was hungry. He's fully God, came from heaven to earth, but he took on humanity and everything about humanity. He's 100% God, 100% man. So he got hungry. We read other places. He got tired. We read other places. You know, where he was tempted, obviously, by Satan. We read other places that um, he got thirsty. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He, obviously, he knows what pain and suffering is. This is why verses like Hebrews 4, 15 are so relevant for us. Look at this verse. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So he's hungry. Verse 19, And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. Now this is very similar to what Jesus just did on the temple mount, where he flips over the money changers' tables. He drove out the, the, the priests and guys are ripping other people off. He was upset because of their hypocrisy. The hypocrisy is they were pretending to be spiritual. They were pretending to be re religious, but they were just ripping people off. They were totally misrepresenting God. That's the picture of this fig tree. It's a sign. It's a symbol of what the chief priests, religious leaders, were doing. They were hypocr hypocrites because this fig tree, it looked like a fig tree, had leaves like a fig tree, but it's lacking the most important thing, fruit. There's no fruit. Why does he do this? Is he mad at trees? No. He knew when he got there, there's not going to be any fruit on this. He's giving us a symbol, though, a sign, because the nation of Israel is often referred to as the fig tree. It's an Old Testament reference to Israel. 
You can write these down. Judges chapter 9, verse 10, it refers to Israel as the fig tree. Jeremiah 24, there's a big section on that, you know, the basket of good figs and bad ones. Hosea 9, verse 10, and Joel chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. So he knew there was not going to be any fruit on this. Just like he knew when he got there, yeah, he'd be accepted. Everybody's excited, but then they would all turn on him in a few days. And they would say, crucify him, crucify him. Unfortunately, this is one of those verses that some believers try to say, okay, God has replaced Israel with the church. And you get into this whole thing about replacement theology. That's not true. God is not done with Israel. That's why I quoted that from Daniel. God still has a work to do. Paul talks about the nation of Israel, that in the end, when Christ returns in Romans 11, 25, and 26, they will see the Lord and they will get saved. Every Jew that survives the Great Tribulation will get saved when they see Jesus coming back. So he's been doing a work. He has not replaced them. The church, it's only Jews and Gentiles who come to Christ, but he is still working on the Jewish people. They're not saved until they come to Christ. Look at verse 20. And when the disciples saw it, this fig tree that just withered, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? Now in Mark chapter 11, 22, the very next thing Jesus says is, Have faith in God. That's important. Have faith in God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly I say to you, if you have faith, it's in God, and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now in the Jewish mind, a mountain was any obstacle, any object, any huge thing that was immovable that stood in your way. But Jesus is more than able to move the obstacles. He's not talking literal mountains. Have you ever seen a mountain fly from one place to another? No. Did Jesus ever do that? No. He's talking about immovable objects in your life. He can take care of these things. This is why our faith needs to be in Him and not in ourselves. We don't put our faith in our faith. This is what one of those verses like the word of faith tries to use this to say, see, I can just get whatever I want. Just name it and claim it. <gasps> I did that for a while. I want that beach house in Maui, Lord, please. In Jesus' name. You know, he's, I got tired of him saying, no, you're not getting it. That's not my will for your life. That's the bottom line. What is his will for your life? This verse does not guarantee us that God will give us whatever we want if we just have enough faith. Here's what we need to keep in mind. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence we have in Him, in the Lord, that if we ask anything, okay, anything, according to His will, that's the important thing, is it according to His will? We, he hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. So the purpose of faith and prayer is not that I can get my will accomplished here on earth, but it's to see God's will accomplished on earth even as it is in heaven. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane when we get to chapter 26 three times. Father, if it is possible, let this cup, talking about the crucifixion, and the wrath of God upon him. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, three times he says, not my will, but your will be done. The word of faith says, that's a wimpy prayer. He shouldn't have prayed that. He's, he's Jesus. He could have asked whatever. No, he had to go. He knew that was the Father's will. That's why he came from heaven to earth, to die on the cross in our place. But he still prayed. If it's possible, it wasn't possible. He knew that. But we don't understand the turmoil he was under at that point. Luke says he's sweating in the garden like drops of blood. I mean, he was under a lot of pressure getting ready on the Garden of Gethsemane. What's Gethsemane mean? It's the olive press. The Garden of Gethsemane, there's a lot of olive trees. And that Gethsemane means olive press. He was getting crushed at that moment getting ready to die for the sins of the world. So again, the purpose of prayer is not for me to get what I want, but it's to see God's will, will, His Word accomplished, just like it is in heaven. So Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen when He rode that little donkey into Jerusalem. He knew that after the initial excitement, 
The religious leaders would betray him. The people would reject him. They would call out, crucify him. He knew the cross would hang over him. But again, that was the Father's plan all along. Jesus must die. He must be sacrificed for the sins of the world. But he must rise from the dead because that's the only way we could have eternal life is he had to conquer the grave. So we'll look at that, Lord willing, next Sunday if we're still around in the freezing cold. Next Sunday morning, as the sun is coming up, wear jackets. But we can look back on why he came 2,000 years ago. We thank him for his love. We thank him for his grace. We thank him for being the perfect sacrifice for our sins. We praise him for giving us eternal life. It's only possible because he conquered the grave. So now we look forward. We look forward to him coming for his bride. At any moment, the trumpet could sound, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So soon and very soon, I think he is coming for his bride. But in the meantime, Jesus said, Occupy until I come. Be about the Father's business. We don't know how long we have. We could get out of here today. It could be next week. It could be next year. It could be 10 years. We don't know. So in the meantime, just keep serving the Lord. Be that light and salt to those who need to hear the good news of Jesus. Amen.